Except that. Boom. There we go. <laughs> That's not it. Are we on the air? <laughs> I'm Harry Wilson. This is Alliance Peace. No. Today we're going to continue with our, our examination and study of. Maybe we might turn that down. By Dr. Francis. Turn on the 16. Oh, there we go, <laughs> hey, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be damned. We're at, we are on. And, uh, good morning, folks. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. My name is Ray Blevins. It's my co-host Jeff D. And this week's guest, Howard Thompson. Howdy. And, uh, please bear with us. We're we're having all kinds of technical difficulties. That's it. Uh, you're hearing that in the background and everything else. Uh, we're in the mini studio. We're no normally in the main, so it's a different number. And he'll be putting that up here shortly. And they look like we're underwater, at least on the monitor we've got. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, uh, there's all kinds of technical difficulties, so please bear with us, folks. This is September 4th? 5th. 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 Thank you. We are live September 5th. Okay. Uh, just to remind everyone, this is brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. Very proud to bring this show to you. Uh, and we meet every Sunday down at the Hot Jumble Bakery, except for the first Sunday of every month, we have our guest speaker. And this week, this month is Steven Weinberg. And we're going to Furs at North Cross Mall at 11 a.m. Uh, this gentleman is a, uh, an author, a Nobel Prize winner in, in physics, and from what I understand, uh, quite uh, entertaining speaker there. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the gentleman in person there. Uh, and that's really it on the announcements for the group. And uh, at this point though, I'd like to give it over to Jeff and see if there's any recent news articles you'd like to share with us. I've got a little bit of news. Um, Baptists to march against Wicca in Killeen tomorrow. As reported by Gordon Fossum of the Fort Hood Open Circle of the Sacred Well Congregation, Reverend Harvey of the Independent Baptist Tabernacle has scheduled a March Against Wickedness for Monday, 6, uh, 6 September. The march is scheduled to convene at 9 a.m. at the Killeen Mall and reconvene at 6 p.m. at the New Age Connection in Copperas Cove. Reverend Harvey is on record with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram as having told his followers to carry handguns to prevent warlocks from taking their children and <laughs> eating them. <laughs> at least two Aww. pagans have received explicit threats on their lives, and at least one offense report has been filed with the police. Uh, now, those of you who have been watching the show know I'm no, uh, I'm no real big fan of the Wiccans myself, but um, they have as much right to their bizarre religious beliefs as these Baptists do, in my opinion. Uh, for th I, I don't really have any background on this story, but uh, my understanding is that there is at least one religious group out there that believes the rapture is going to occur on the 11th, which is next, what would that be, next Saturday? So uh, we'll, all, we'll all be waiting in anticipation of that. Um, Vatican sends envoy to Venice Film Festival. The Vatican, for the first time, sent an ambassador to the Venice Film Festival on Saturday to promote its own spiritual cinema, cinema gala and make contacts among Hollywood movie moguls. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's just what we need, is to have the Catholic Church get its tentacles into uh, the film industry. Uh, on the orders of Pope John Paul II, Cardinal Paul Popard swept around the festival in his black and red robes between visits to filmmakers, but said he wouldn't have time to mingle with stars or see Kate Winslet's new film, Holy Smoke. <laughs> Uh, the Pope, a film buff himself, has asked Cardinal Poupard to forge friendships with the film world as he considers cinema to be one of the most important forms of communication today. Uh, slightly we're better. Still yeah, we're still playing um, with the cameras there. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the Pope considers one of the cinema to be one of the most important forms of communication today, a Vatican spokesman said. The Vatican will hold its own third millennium film festival in December. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. By no reckoning does the third millennium begin in December. <laughs> By no reckoning that I could, that, I, that I'm aware of, um, they have their own calendar. Yeah, the, that's true. A, and any calendar is justified. As just and if you're counting by by Christ, assuming there even was an historical one, that would have to have been at least uh, three and a half years ago. Anyway, uh, let's see. 
the Vatican will hold its own Third Millennium Film Festival in December, one of the first events under the logo of the Jubilee, which will follow a war theme. Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, starring Tom, starring Tom Hanks, and Thin Red Line will be among 20 films shown at the gala. There aren't any prizes because it wouldn't be right to say one film was spiritually better than another, <laughs> said the Vatican Festival's director, Claudio Siniscali. During his Venice trip, Cardinal Poupard was also to, due to celebrate Mass at St. Mark's Cathedral on Sunday before returning to Rome. The Venice Festival centered on a theme of sex this year and opened with Stanley Kubrick's steamy thriller Eyes Wide Shut. Following this theme, Un Liaison Pornographique about a couple who based their relationship on sex was premiering on Saturday, as was Holy Smoke. The problem with many films today is that they don't focus on the human condition, Cardinal Poupard lamented. That's right, because human beings really have no interest in sex whatsoever. Uh, investors fear losses in Arizona Baptist Foundation. The Baptist Foundation of America was created in 1948 by the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention and manages money for Southern Baptist charities. Last month, the BFA froze all new and existing accounts, and state regulators ordered a halt in security sales. State investigators say the foundation misrepresented the securities and their returns and doesn't have enough money to cover all the investments. State regulators estimate that investors had poured $483 million into the foundation by the end of 1998. Mark Sendrow, director of the Securities Division at the Arizona Corporation Commission, said the investigation could take months. Investors, particularly church members, were lured by high interest rates and assurances that the investment money would benefit churches and ministries, according to investigators. Literature from late 1997 promised returns ranging from 6% for a six-month note to 11% for a 15-year note. Sendrow said it looks like the foundation ran into problems in the 1980s with the decline of the real estate market. Rather than writing them down, they apparently engaged in a series of manipulative operations to hide their losses, he said. BFA officials say they are cooperating with the investigation and reviewing their assets. Uh, Philip Feigen, executive director of Washington-based North American Security Administrators Association, which represents state security regulation, regulators, said investors tend to trust investment firms with which they have religious ties. Trust can be intoxicating, he said. Unfortunately, with investing, that always means higher risk. You have to treat them, uh, presumably he's talking about the investment outfits, have to treat them like strangers or you face a greater risk. Even the letter dated August 7th, telling investors that their accounts had been frozen, used religion. God has not promised that every day would be easy, <laughs> and God has promised that he would be with us every step of the way, unquote. On August 26, the BFA board fired William Crotz, the foundation's president since 1982, its legal counsel, and its controller. Still, 136 staff members remain on the payroll. And I, only, I can only wonder where their, where their salary is coming from if it's not getting sucked right out of the remaining money that we that's amazing. pay back their that investors. That I guess even, God will remain with them the rest of the way until there's absolutely not a dime left. Even when they're going downhill there, they still you, you throw God out there. Amazing. Yeah. Now, it's not our fault, folks. God pro didn't promise that everything would be easy. It's God's fault. Uh, I've got the new issue of the Skeptical Inquirer. This is a magazine by scientists uh, reviewing uh, claims of the supernatural scientifically. Can we get a close-up on this? There we go. And there's an article in it, Where Do We Come From?, talking about the abiogenesis question. And... Uh, and talking about all the, the prevailing theories. I just want to uh, read this one short section. Uh, in a, it's entitled, The Alternative Answer, What About God? And um, talks about various, various creationist claims. Should a skeptic reject outright any possibility of special creation of life? Well, no. Although implausible, it is still possible. There are two points that must be borne in mind, however, before going uh, for that sort of explanation of the origin of us all. First, it has to be true that we really don't have any clue about how life on Earth originated by natural means. As we will see in the rest of the article, though the situation is messy, it is not that desperate. Second, the mere fact that we cannot currently or even ever explain something does not constitute positive evidence 
for a supernatural explanation. After all, for a long time, we did not know what natural phenomena could cause lightning. But eventually, theories based on Zeus's anger turned out to be incorrect. Consequently, it may be that the only rational position for the time being is simply a provisional and salutary, I don't know. Um, and, and with that, to stay open-minded and continue to search. Exactly. Yes. Uh, they also talk about, in this issue, the Audrey Santo case. That's a girl in Mexico who is in a coma, and uh, local religious people have declared her some kind of miracle, and they go to this girl in a coma and pray and think that they're going to get... Their, their prayers to come true. And there's a report on a Fox News show on the Egyptian pyramids where apparently Fox News seriously suggested that aliens might have built those pyramids in this purportedly news program and, and other interesting things. It's a great magazine. It, it um, sounds like it, yes. And finally, this isn't really religion news. I mean, it's, it's, got, a, it's got a religious element to it, but... Um, uh, we just think it's amusing and we want to read it on the air. Uh, in June, in Christchurch, New Zealand, Thomas Hendry, 23, won the How Far Will You Go contest at Trader McKendry's Tavern for a prize of about 300 American dollars by sta stapling his penis to a crucifix and setting it on fire. Uh, it doesn't make it clear whether he set his penis or the crucifix on fire. I don't think it really matters. Uh, Hendry so, said he needed to pay some bills and was inspired by an early conte earlier contestant who merely pierced his foreskin with a safety pin. Quote, I thought I could do better than that, unquote. Hendry's mother was in the bar that night and said, I'm just very relieved that he won. I would have hated for someone to go through all that and lose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read that and I missed the fact that his mother, his was, mother there was there. This guy's stapling <laughs> his penis to a crucifix and setting one of those two things on fire. That's awesome. amazing, yes. Uh, was and there a the National uh, Endowment uh, for the Arts uh, grant for that one? Or is nope. that, we, we can't blame that. Okay. Private individuals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, regular viewers might uh, remember Howard Thompson. We've, he's been on the show before. And uh, you are the editor for the Texas Atheist. Is that That's correct. It was an electronic newsletter. Yes. And uh, you want to just reintroduce yourself to the okay. audience there? Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen me before, uh, I am Howard Thompson. I am an atheist activist here in Texas. I uh, publish an electronic newsletter that you can get by email. It's free called the Texas Atheist. And uh, at some point, we'll have cameras on, on the card here that'll give you my email address where you can read it. Uh, my email is gofreemind at aol.com, and that's the way you can get it. Uh, and I've come here today uh, to talk very briefly about a topic that we run into a lot in the news, and that is uh, this myth that America, the United States, is a Christian nation. Excellent. Yeah, we get a lot of calls on that. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more to this than the myth the Christians have of it. They're very convinced of it. They keep repeating it. Uh, they tend to ignore or not uh, remember or don't look for information that contradicts this. And we're going to go into very briefly some of that today. Um, and I've got my high-tech uh, little uh, display equipment here to help you out. But first I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the myth of Christian United States, Christian America was. Uh, very simply based, you can call it, uh, the myth that the Christians came to America seeking religious freedom. They founded colonies based on God's laws. Our revolution, constitution, democracy, and freedoms are based on their Christian principles, and America now needs to restore its rightful Christian government. Uh, this concept uh, drives a lot of the religious right uh, politics. Uh, the idea is that there was a golden age in the past, America's uh, colonial beginnings and around America Revolution where uh, our nation was a Christian nation and we've gotten away from that with uh, nasty uh, atheists and secular humanists and uh, other people who uh, have destroyed the real basis for uh, America's uh, beginning which is uh, Christianity. However, uh, this is a false thing as we're going to go into. The first uh, thing we want to look at is uh, how religious were the colonists. Uh, in a book called The Churching of America, which is a paperback which is out in the stores now, uh, the researchers have gone through some information uh, and data about churches in colonial America right around 1790. 
Uh, they base their data and their estimates on account of the churches and then the size of the churches, the amount of pew space in the churches, and came up with pretty much a maximal figure of 17% of the colonists, uh, or at that point uh, the Americans, could have actually gone to church and attended church. So the maximum amount of church membership at that time was 17%. Uh, there are some estimates that run as low as 10%. Right now, churches claim 66% membership, uh, yet I notice if I look at my Texas Almanac and I go in and look at church membership by counties in Texas, uh, that the Texas Almanac shows 25 Texas counties with greater than 100% of the population in church membership, so that we know church membership uh, data is, in fact, skewed. Uh, something else to remember is that church activities were basically an upper class sort of thing back then. Uh, the wealthy, the landowners, uh, the skilled craftsmen who had money, those were the people who could go to church. Uh, laborers, farmers, servants, slaves, American Indians of course were excluded from this. And uh, the image we have that our colonial founders were very religious is based on the fact that they were the educated ones, they were the ones that did a lot of writing, and later historians who are Christians tend to focus on them uh, and that history and ignore the other history. Now you could make a claim that our culture may be Christian. After all, about 85% of the people now uh, claim Christianity as a religion one way or another, though Pat Robertson thinks it's only really about 17 or 18%. But the thing to remember is Christianity is only one among uh, many cultural traits in the United States. Uh, you could call us capitalists or industrialists or a technological culture or an educated culture or a, a wage worker, hourly wage worker culture, lots of other things. Uh, Christianity is only one among those and not necessarily the most important and certainly all, not the broadest or inclusive uh, description of America. Back in colonial times, uh, you could have uh, called us a frontier spirit, slave-holding, uh, conquest type of culture that was very expansionist at that time, which again applied to more people than were just going to church. Now, I'm not saying that Christianity was not important and didn't play a role in the history of our nation, but it certainly has a very poor claim in historical times and still a very poor claim in terms of culture to be the one word which one could use to describe our nation. <clears throat> Next thing we can ask is, is our government a Christian government? Uh, one of the things the theonomists, uh, the Bible scholars who like to say that our nation is based on God's law and the Ten Commandments and the principles of God's law are all throughout uh, our Constitution and our nation's founding. Uh, well, if you don't look any farther and you believe that, then I guess that's what you believe. But the reality is, is that at the 1787 Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, uh, the delegates who went to that from the states did something very strange. They rejected the idea of Christian government because Christian government was God's selected rulers. We established a constitution in the government with elected leaders. Christian government had state churches. Our constitution separated religion from government, particularly with the First Amendment. Uh, our constitution is uh, by the authority of the we the people, not God's authority. Uh, and the human rights that the Constitution and Bill of Rights uh, address are human defined rights and not God's moral law. So in many ways our Constitution was a startlingly unique and radical document which broke with Western civilization's traditions of Christian government and it's, it's utterly uh, false and a blatant lie for Christians to claim that our Constitution and government were grounded upon Christian principles. Christianity did not invent any of the things that we think of as our democracy and our freedom. And just to give you an idea of how extensive this was at the Constitutional Convention, uh, the Constitutional Convention did not begin its sessions with prayers. There were two motions for prayers offered one day, one by Benjamin Franklin and one by Randall of Virginia. Both of those motions were allowed to die by adjournment. In the notes that Benjamin Franklin put on his copy of his motion for prayer, he noted that only three or four were interested in having prayers and the rest thought it was unnecessary. There is a tradition that Alexander Hamilton had remarked that they did not need the help of a foreign power. That's only a tradition. I've not been able to uh, substantiate that, but that gives you an idea of what people were thinking at that time. Our Constitution had no religious test for office. Uh, that was unique at that time. 
uh, all the tests for office in almost all the state constitutions at that time uh, limited somebody from office on a religious basis. You either had to be uh, a Christian or a Protestant. Uh, uh, Unitarians couldn't be elected. Baptists couldn't be elected in some cases. Catholics certainly couldn't be elected. Not Jews, not unbelievers, not deists, even though deists uh, were the primary force in uh, writing the Constitution. Uh, the presidential oath of office in the Constitution does not end with, so help me God, as our presidents currently end it with. Uh, and I know this is a surprise to many people. Go dig out your copy of the Constitution, look it up. That's the way it is. The oath was on the honor of the man taking the office and not on uh, God's uh, will and help. And of course, then the First Amendment has its separation clause, uh, which very distinctly separates civil government and the business of civil government out from uh, religious activities. Now, there are a lot of people who say, oh, no, no, the founders really didn't mean that. Uh, they, they were really pious Christians, and uh, uh, there's lots of pious words in the Declaration of Independence and other places uh, to let us know that they were really Christians, and it's just a mistaken interpretation. Well, there's uh, places in John Adams' writing, and John Adams was one of our early presidents, where he talks about uh, the creation of our constitution and government without a pretense of miracle or mystery. Well, by gosh, that's not a Christian statement there, because Christianity is based on miracles and mystery. There's Jefferson's uh, famous letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. This is a letter written, uh, I believe, during Jefferson's second term in office, in which he explained to the, uh, the Danbury Baptists uh, that he would not uh, issue a proclamation for a national day of fasting and prayer, as they had requested, because there was a wall of separation between church and state. Uh, and this was a remarkable act for Jefferson because the Baptists at that time were among the leaders of supporting uh, religious freedoms. Of course, that was their own version of religious freedoms. Uh, but they were among those at that time who were helping expand the idea of religious freedom and the idea of separating church from government, though perhaps not as far as Jefferson would have wanted. Uh, James Madison introduced an amendment to go with the Ten uh, Amendments of the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, that he considered the most important of all of them. One of the provisions of this amendment was for freedom of conscience uh, not being uh, infringed upon by any states. This foreshadowed the 14th Amendment, which applied civil rights at the federal level to the state level. Uh, and this is the one that Madison thought was most important. This amendment of Madison's passed in the House of Representatives. It failed in the Senate, uh, basically on a states' rights issue. But very clearly, Madison, who was one of the leaders in uh, uh, guiding uh, lights of the Constitutional Convention, uh, was not putting forth Christian ideas, uh, was not uh, expressing the Ten Commandments or God's law. Uh, he was really trying to separate religion. And then later, when he was president, he vetoed two bills Congress passed that would have given some land to churches, one in the District of Columbia and one in Mississippi, which gives a clear idea of how uh, one of the most important authors of the Constitution uh, thought about separating church from government and government not helping churches. The harsh reality that Christians don't particularly want you to know is that our Constitution, far from being based upon Christian principles and God's law, was based on free-thinking principles from the Enlightenment. If uh, you were fortunate enough to have a history course that still mentions uh, Rousseau and the social contract uh, and Voltaire and uh, John Locke and Montesquieu and some other authors that our founding fathers uh, read and very heavily depended upon, uh, you'll understand uh, this principle because uh, elected government, uh, democracy, uh, separating church from state, not having state churches, all of those principles came from the enlightened free thinkers uh, of France and England and not from uh, any biblical scholars or the letters of Paul or anything of that nature. In fact, if you go to the letters of Paul, uh, Paul talks about rulers you know, ordained by God uh, and ruling is the will of God and you should obey them. Uh, no references to any type of, uh, of freedom concepts that we think of today. Uh, free thinkers recognized human rights. Uh, there was the rights of man from the French Revolution, uh, which had a great uh, intellectual impact in this country. And then there was representative democracy. So uh, Christianity is essentially trying to hijack uh, credit for the uh, constitutional freedoms and the human rights and the civil rights and the democratically elected government we have and say, oh no, that was a Christian idea, when Christianity was utterly uh, contrary and opposed to that. 
uh, and take a credit away from uh, the Enlightenment free thinkers uh, who really did create all those ideas and did give us the kind of government we have. <clears throat> now, if you go away with one thing from this little mini lecture that I hope you remember, it's that if no prayer was good enough for our founding fathers, this is at their constitutional convention, no prayer should be good enough for all our public officials, especially in the conduct of their civil office. I mean, you have cases like it happening down in Santa Fe, Texas now, uh, near Texas City, uh, where people going to football games are forced to listen to prayers. Uh, forced worship is un-American by how our founders wrote the Constitution, by the principles of the free thinkers of the Enlightenment upon which our Constitution was based. Uh, and they are quite literally uh, violating in spirit and deed uh, the Constitution, and they are uh, any public officials who support public worship at government events is uh, in violation of their oath to uphold the Constitution, plain and simple. And uh, last thing is uh, the point that Christian America is a propaganda myth that mobilizes evangelicals to destroy our secular constitutional government. They try to wrap themselves in a the flag. Uh, they try to make Christianity part of America's nationalism and our uh, past. But what they're really trying to do is destroy and overthrow the Constitution of the United States and institute a Christian government under the guise that they're mis just merely restoring some wonderful golden age of Christianity that we had where everything was wonderful and happy and good and that we need to get back to that. And that's pretty much your mini lecture for the morning, guys. Well, no, you did uh, great. You, uh, it's always good to have someone who comes on with that much research because we get questions about the Founding Fathers all the time. And odds are, though, once we have an expert on the subject, we never get a caller that, uh, that it, never, it never fails we have a scientist on or whatever else. Just remind everyone, this is September 5th. We are taking calls live on the air here. Uh, we're having technical difficulties. I, I see lights going on and off. Well, I think we're, I think we're having fun. As long as the camera's, well, camera's sure. still on me. I was going to hold up one book for the sure. people here in Austin. Uh, actually, I've got two books. Uh, this is The Godless Constitution by Isaac Kramnik and R. Lawrence Moore. Uh, and the reason I'm holding it up is because it's a good source. Also, I found it in half price books. Uh, within the last two months, so you can probably pick this up for six or seven dollars. Uh, this is the kind of excellent. We're not allowed to talk prices, but go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm That's all right. <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, I, it was an ex it was a price estimate. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand you're not selling the book. No, I'm not selling the book. I understand. Technically, we're not allowed to talk prices. Uh, but this was it. This was at half price books. If you want to get some information, another one I picked up and I'm working through is by a uh, Catholic priest, uh, and it takes a little bit different view, uh, but it. Uh, it's called First Freedoms. Uh, it does have an awful lot of detailed information uh, about uh, the relationship of government uh, and Christianity and the state religions, uh, going into blow by blow stuff, you know, all the way from the Puritans uh, on into uh, the early 1800s. Uh, and it's an excellent source of information if you want something more technical. The First Freedoms, I also picked this one up at Half Price Books. So that's two right. books. That's two books you have available that you might be able to find uh, locally. Okay, and uh, just remind you, uh, we only mention those as reference material, yes. and there's plenty of reference material out there, And but you recommend yes. these as good reference Well, these, these were readily available. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, what, what I want to point out to the, uh, the viewers that might not know it, is that our Joe? I don't know. Well, uh, when, did, uh, when did this myth really take hold? Uh, my understanding, it was like during the Cold War, Cold War, uh, with uh, Russia and everything else, that, that uh, they really, that, that the whole myth of the Christian nation really took hold. Well, it really, uh, it, that, that's about right. Sometime between World War I and World War II and uh, on into the early 50s, uh, there was a transition in Christian thinking. Uh, up until then, they had opposed uh, basically the Constitution a little bit more openly uh, in favor of state churches uh, and the involvement of religion and government. Uh, that has turned out to be a very unsuccessful strategy for them. Uh, it's really been since roughly the 50s and 60s uh, that the Christian strategy, uh, well, Christians probably too broad, evangelicals, uh, conservative uh, political Christians, whatever you want to call them, uh, that they changed their strategy and started trying to uh, redefine our past as a Christian past uh, that they had to restore instead of saying that the Constitution was, uh, uh, was wrong and it should have been a Christian government all along. All right. Uh no, honestly, I appreciate uh, mm -hmm. all the research you've done, and you've done an excellent job. Mm -hmm. we will, okay. We're going to try the phone. Okay. Uh, let's see what happens here. 
Hello? Joe? Yeah. Joe Zemecki, yes, it is No, Joe. I'm not, no. Oh, I'm no, sorry? This, I'm, I'm sorry, um, this is another Joe. Okay, no, I'm First sorry. First of all, I got a quick comment. Sure. Even though I am a Christian, sure. I'll, I agree with y'all almost 100%. Oh, good. Right. Thank you. Because um, I don't really, th I think our Constitution was not exactly founded on um, traditional Christianity, because like traditional Christianity, um, for example, was, um, the sovereignty of kings. Yes. Exactly. Whereas, if you were against the king, you were against God. Yes. And that was the radical. I mean, that was a radical view. But, um, I mean, to to say that we're. I mean, the revolution, in a way, would have been a radical departure from that. Yes. Um, my 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 quick question would be: Is uh, for the number of people that signed the Constitution of the Declaration of Independence, I've heard three things. Is first. The, a majority, a majority of them were Calvinists. Second, a majority of them were probably High Church Anglicans. Or three, um, a majority of them were Deists. I was just wondering. Um, no, it's an excellent question, and yeah. uh, Howard's done the research. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me let me respond to that. Sure. Uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, need to be considered a bit separately. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is a political document. It's it's not the government of our land. Uh, it does have religious language, uh, or let's say maybe not religious language. It does have God talk in there. Jefferson wrote about our Creator uh, and nature's God. Uh, but if you look at that God talk, you'll notice that it's a deistic sort of talk. It's not a specific to any religion, and certainly not Christianity. Christian elements such as uh, Jesus or the Trinity of the Holy Spirit are, are not referenced in the Declaration of Independence. Now, I, I don't know the makeup of the body of the people who signed the Declaration. I do know that uh, deists were fairly strong, Unitarian were fairly strong at that time coming out of the Congregationalist churches uh, but uh, I'm sure there were Baptists also that were signing it because they were uh, strong supporters. The Constitutional Convention is, is approximately the same. Uh, what we do know though is, is that there was a large battle for ratifying the Constitution uh, in all of the 13 states. Uh, in every state there was a challenge uh, mounted uh, against the absence of uh, reference to God uh, and religious tests for office in particular. In every state it was defeated. This was a big political issue. The people knew what the issue was and all of the states ratified the Constitution as written. So, so whatever they were, whatever their beliefs, uh, the idea of uh, a civil government without much reference uh, to religion or God uh, did win the day back then. Uh, uh, I have a bunch of other callers. Okay, and well, I guess I, I guess yeah. I need to change my name so I won't get mixed up with the other Joe. <laughs> right. No, no, he kind of sounded the same too. Yeah, when That's you when, when you first started talking, you sounded just like him. No. Okay. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that we have open-minded Christians watching the show. No, thank you very much. You take care. All right, let's go on down to. Al. Good morning, Al. Al. Well, Hello. let's try. Did, did we lose? Or? Louise. Yes, hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, I think your presentation is great. Oh, thank and, you. And I think it's well thought out and rational. I don't think you went far back, far enough back into American history, however. Interesting. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, go ahead. The, the early uh, colonial period up to the Constitution and up to the uh, Declaration of Independence, when um, there were several colonies, not all of the colonies, but several of the colonies declared themselves as religious states. Is, yes. Isn't that correct? And for someone to move from one colony to another was... Um, they sometimes took their lives in their hands because they were going into a foreign territory where they were required to believe in a certain way. And there were a great number of conflicts between the colonies because of religious differences, even though many of these people came from Europe to get away from religious persecution, many of the colonies actually um, had persecution yes, no. written into their uh, bylaws. Well, let's, uh, you make a very good point. Let's take the example of the Puritans. Uh, and the good point is that a lot of people did come seeking religious freedom. Some of them uh, tried to practice it, practice it to some degree. Some of them didn't and imposed uh, theocratic tyrannies. Uh, the Puritans were certainly that way. For example, they ran the Quakers out of their early colonies. 
uh, and when they couldn't shut them up, they would uh, flog them or put them in the stocks or cut off the men's ears or burn holes through the women's tongues or hang them. So there was a lot of, uh, of violence about this back then. But even then, during that environment, uh, the, the, the threads of the free thinking enlightenment uh, were making their way to America. And I think the important thing is that uh, that early area, uh, era of uh, Christian uh, dominance, if you will, of American colonies uh, faded away and failed. And people right. did turn to right. something else. And by the time you get to the Constitution uh, and the ratification sessions, uh, in, in some ways it's, it's a very startling fact when you read all of the religious activity back then and all of the... Uh, uh, rhetoric uh, against uh, the lack of religion and God in the Constitution that uh, 13 uh, state legislators uh, passed it as written. That's exactly true. And I think with that as, as a background, <clears throat> some of the things like Pat Robertson is, you know, as you said before, what, what people like him are going for is really, I think, a return not to the, the time of the founding fathers of the Constitution, Correct. but back to the previous time yes when they had these theistic colonies that were ruled yes. by one code uh, that someone decided is the right code of religious um, belief and and um, anyone who disagreed with that was yeah, they, was driven out or put to the stake or whatever yeah and that, that that's a that's a good point but uh it, one good thing about those Congregationalist Puritans, uh, you know, aside from the, you know, the witch trials and all of the things they did do, uh, is they did believe that uh, you could rationally come to God and they did support education early on. It was right, all religious right. education for, for ministers, but uh, in, in a sense uh, that uh, respect for education and knowledge and learning uh, turned out to be their own undoing because it was out of that that uh, uh, people uh, learned to think for themselves, some right. of the Congregationalists right. did, and uh, went back and got the old uh, Greek and Roman scholars and the new uh, free-thinking scholars from uh, France and, and England, and uh, that's how those ideas came about, and that's how Unitarianism, I, I think, uh, right. arose. Right, and, and I, I think the new <clears throat> religious right, even, even though they have built this coalition of various churches and, and beliefs, under the guise or maybe even under the mistaken belief of religious freedom if these people were really to have the power they want i think they would um they would very seriously limit the religious freedom of of those who were outside of the actual government that they set up uh, you're right i was, was going to say look uh the intelligence levels of our callers this morning have been quite well and, uh, and <laughs> thank you yes and uh, i'm very impressed and uh, and it, it might have something to do with our guests there. It seems like we have good guests. We he have brought good us colors. up to his level. Yes. <laughs> well, well, let's see. That, and for just for the audience can understand how we measure intelligence level, they agree with us, <laughs> they don't agree with us. <laughs> well, of course. Uh, well, Pat Robertson always said that, too. <laughs> we well, appreciate your call. Thank you. You have a great week. You, too. Bye. Yes, and uh, I like to think I'm a little bit more open-minded than that, but uh, it does help if you agree with me, yes. Uh, let's go on down to... Uh, Sam. Uh, hi. Good morning. Sam, yes. Good yeah, morning. you point anybody now, right? And, uh, all right, uh, you know, what would be a good day to start the um, uh, calendar from instead of the mythical birth of you-know-who there? Uh, that's a good question. And, uh, uh, I actually, uh, one of the other producers on this Access channel ha is trying to get his own calendar started there, somatics. Really? Yes, it's mm -hmm. quite interesting. Uh, well, so, what did he propose for number for the uh, sort of starting date, if any? Uh, it, it, this would be the tenth millennium, according to his calendar. Well, what happened at the uh, tenth millennium? You know, they say the Chinese are going to have the Y two K problem. How come? I thought they had their own calendar, five thousand years old or more. I, uh, uh, that they, they, they use Western computer hardware. The the, uh. mo <laughs> the most interesting point about uh, the millennium coming up. Uh, we went through all this millennium crap at one thousand. But it. Uh, uh, we were using different calendars, so it wasn't a worldwide date there that the world sat down and said this is the new millennium there. This time, it's coming up and the whole entire world is using the same calendar. So it, uh, it's pretty amazing that we've come that far, but uh, you, could, you could pick one year, it means no more significance than any other year. Do you, do you have a preference there, Sam? 
No, I, I mean, basically, sort of, uh, I guess scientifically, that's true. But then for human purposes, we do sort of have to uh, start at a certain place. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be sort of difficult. I mean, it's true, it's really only the intervals between. But uh, for some reason, it seemed like it's, uh, it make um, uh, practical things more difficult. You sort of want to uh, single out some single day. I guess you could make it the founding of the, of the American Republic or something like that, but then the rest of the world might object to that. Yeah. We're having uh, trouble with the speaker. Yeah, right Sam, and, uh, sorry. Uh, your phone call is coming through really strange here. Uh, we do appreciate your input. Uh, I, I'm going to have to let you go, though, because it, it's really sounding bad. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, thank you, Sam. I, I, would, yeah. I would like to respond to his, his question. Yeah, I think go right ahead. The compromise that's, that scholars have hit on in recent years um, of talking about uh, re, uh, renaming that point um, to, uh, to CE rather than AD. Common era. Common era manages to remove the <sighs> religious bias from it and, and still leave us with, you know, some arbitrary, uh, you know, point uh, to start our calendars, which we're going to have to have regardless. So, yeah, given all the trouble, given all the trouble we had from going, uh, trying to go to metric and it didn't work out, uh, I'd be reluctant to say change the calendars now. <laughs> well, we are officially a yes. metric. And, yes. Uh, and we agree, yeah, that, oh, that's an old nother story, but we actually agreed in the metric system back in 1890. <laughs> And, and, uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to try the phones again here and see if they're doing any better. Let's go on down to Tom. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Tom. Uh, listen, congratulations on your show. i uh, watched it a few times. I have two Thank things you. to say. Uh, okay. One, can you give us, uh, repeat that uh, business at the top when you talked about the uh, guest speaker for so, the first Monday, tell us when and where again. You, you kind of, we went through that very quickly. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate. I appreciate. I'd be glad to. Okay. Uh, uh, let me let me get to sure. number two if I okay. could, because it's really <laughs> the body of, of, of the uh, call. Sure. Um, I've seen the show a few times, and uh, one of my criticisms might be, and it may be uh, unfair because I haven't seen it a lot, is that you seem to be basically reacting to Christianity where uh, it seems to me that Christianity is, is merely the latest manifestation of a kind of, uh, of uh, collective aberration or mental illness. Uh, religion, to begin with, is a kind of magical thinking. Uh, so have you ever thought of, of uh, approaching the uh, question of atheism, which in itself is a, probably a bogus term, but uh, approaching the question of religion in terms of cultural anthropology, and and uh, and we, cultural we actually, psychology. Yeah, and uh, we actually have people in the group that's actually doing more research on that. Uh, and we're we're equal opportunity offenders. <laughs> you know, we don't we we talk mostly about Christianity as a side effect of the fact that that's the religion that dominates our culture. And well, if, if you caught me at the beginning of the show, you know, uh, we we've talked about say the Wiccans recently. Um, the Wiccans are are in Killeen are under pressure from the Christians in Killeen to stop having their religion. Well, and, this is and, this and is why I br actually I brought this no. up because yeah. if I'd like to hear some things said about uh, the Hindus, yeah. about uh, Buddhism, and about uh, other other religions, and it seems to me that uh, time after huh. time your your shows are uh, right. anti-Christian, which in itself is has a value, but uh, but I think if you broaden the context. Yeah, let me, let me we talk go. about that stuff when it's in the news. And uh, uh, it's I was going to point out the news as often because in the United States it's uh, ninety. What is that? Eighty-five percent uh, Christian. Christian. Yeah. So and it, and if you just look here on the Access Channel, uh, ninety percent of the shows are Christian religious shows. They're giving their twist on it. So, uh, but Howard yeah. had a comment anyway. Yeah. Right? Well, well, Tom, I I agree with you, uh, and it's it's not really. You know, not really a, a criticism of this show because it's a call-in show. And most of the people uh, who do call uh, from the times I've been on are Christians and want to kind of argue with atheists. Uh, but I agree that uh, atheism uh, really is not an intellectual endpoint uh, of, of your search for uh, trying to understand reality. It's really a beginning point because once you become an atheist, then you're uh, one step away from rejecting all magic and supernaturalism. Right. And, and you're now at a place where you say, gosh, I can accept reality as materialistic, and that means you now have a whole different uh, a framework uh, for uh, approaching all the issues of human uh, behavior and uh, society, arranging and governing itself and, and, and cultural values. Uh, and, and to me, it's a beginning, and it's a but it's a difficult beginning because 
uh, all of the religions that have existed have within them, you know, lots of uh, natural human instincts and behaviors. Uh, so, uh, you know, everything in religion isn't bad. You just don't throw it all out. But if, if you're an atheist and you accept a material reality, uh, you know, of a consistent, you know, universe of matter and energy that interacts, uh, then you really do have to go back and say, how much of my thinking, how much of my beliefs, uh, how much of what I think is right and wrong are still based on magical ideas that, that got into me when I was a kid that I really haven't thought about. Right. Uh, and I think atheism should uh, take upon itself uh, uh, the burden and the role of trying to develop a, a completely new uh, materialistic culture, not that it would throw out everything that religions have, but I certainly think we ought to review and assess those things from a different viewpoint. Right. And the other side of the coin, too, is uh, the politicians are out there courting their vote right now and, yeah. and trying to... Uh, so they, we need to educate the people on exactly what they mean when they say Christian views and everything else. So uh, we feel it's important for us to get our point of view out there just so that you can make an informed uh, decision when it comes to the ballots. Okay, and, and toward that end, um, uh, from a technical point of view, uh, the person over the phone I can hear best is your guest. I can barely oh. hear... I can barely hear you guys. I don't know if it's... Okay. Uh, we're, we're still playing. I, I appreciate the input. <laughs> it's very difficult to hear all of you. Thank okay. you. Thank okay. you, Tom. You have a great week. It, uh, as you see, it, one of those days that we're still having uh, problems here with the phone. This is September 5th, and uh, Tom also asked about the speaker, uh, our guest speaker today, yes. which uh, the first <coughs> Sunday, he also said Monday, uh, the first Sunday of every month uh, we meet... Today. Which is today, yes. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> uh, We meet at Furs at North Cross Mall, and we have a guest lecturer come in there, and this month is Steven Weinberg. He's a UT professor, Nobel Prize winner in physics. Uh, he's, I don't remember the two books. He's got two books out there, and I, uh, uh, but they have to do with physics. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Ray. <laughs> Yes, uh, he's the guy. Who will be speaking to the uh, yes. Afternoon. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking and talking at the same well, time. So. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I well, understand he's a lot better at thinking and talking than I am. Yeah, uh, Stephen Weinberg was in the news uh, I earlier in the summer when there was a uh, conference held in Washington Thank on uh, trying to get religion uh, and science together and uh, and try to say there are really uh, no differences between them. And according to the news reports, uh, Stephen Weinberg got up and said. Uh, you all are full of bull hockey, you know, religion and science are very different, uh, and, and so he's one of my heroes, and I'm looking forward to seeing him. All right, uh, let's try the phones again. <coughs> David? Uh, yes, um, what I understand from the materialistic point of view is that uh, you're using the scientific method, which is also the method that the science absorbs um, the world and reality. Uh, by that definition, it's limited only to the data that you have in front of you, which means that uh, you might say that uh, you, up to the knowledge that you have up to now, uh, you have your uh, belief. But it is limited. And True. Okay, and so no. it's already a limited... Yeah, it why well, it isn't limited? Uh, it, I, 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 I'm agreeing with the caller, and how's every second he said no? Uh, I do too. But the point is, the limit that you deal with, and uh, when you approach things scientifically, is a limit you have to deal with. And if you pretend that you've got spiritual insights that allow you to ignore that limit, then you're lying to yourself. Right, but it's your limit, meaning your perception. Now, let's assume that other people took their time, their life to investigate that matter, uh, and I'm talking about some mystics, sure. and they went into an inner observation as well as out of, of outer observation, and if you study uh, those mystics from all over the world, and most of them did not have any connection between each other, and they all came with a picture of reality and uh, uh, of human nature and of the body. I mean, they did a, 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 an intensive uh, uh, study like Buddha, uh, or like uh, the mystics of the Jews, uh, yeah. or also the mystical. We understand the, where you're going. And when they looked inside, what were they looking at? Well, they were all looking at human beings. Well, here's the point. You don't know what they're looking at. They are coming with their observation, and it's similar to other observations that are not connected, meaning they, they do not know about each other. They're what coming... They have, what they have in common is that they're all human beings looking inward, and presumably what's inside each of those human beings has some... Uh, some 
vague resemblance yeah. to other human beings, no matter what culture they're from. Exactly. And on top of that, I mean, to talk about limits now, um, you know, we also get out of these these uh, these mystics and spiritual various spiritual movements, we get claims of like levitation and all kinds of other things, which could be demonstrated uh, in an unambiguous fashion scientifically if they were true. And since they don't get demonstrated, you got to start suspecting that what's happening is when these people are they're, they're bumping around inside their heads trying to figure stuff out, and what they do is they convince themselves of stuff that doesn't, in fact, happen to be true. Uh, what about the fact that uh, similar experiences have been absorbed by many religions in different parts of the world that, are not, that were not connected to each other? I mean, Again, they're all human beings. Right. I, I, it's all human beings. Nobody say that uh, it's not a, a, that a connection to God is not a human being experience. No, uh, no, my, my point is, my point is, if uh, uh, if you get two people in two different cultures who independently come up with the idea that it would be neat if um, uh, if they could if they could uh, uh, want things really hard and then those things would come true, right? Right, and it takes the form of prayer or magic or whatever whatever spin they put on it from their individual cultural perspective. Right. Well, what you're dealing with is you got human beings, and human beings would like stuff that they want to come true. And if they can convince themselves that want that makes it come true, then that's exactly what they will do. And it doesn't require any spiritual reality for them to have independently come up with this idea. I understand what you say. The only thing what they're saying is that it's connected to um, a higher source. It's not only coming to form them. Meaning, they are a vehicle in which that energy can be uh, uh, man manifested or uh, materially um, um, uh, created, but well, still... Well, if they could materially create stuff, then they could do that in front of scientists, and scientists would verify that what they're doing is, is real. But what? since they can't uh, verify that in front of scientists, what we're dealing with is a bunch of people who have convinced themselves that, that they've got an idea that's true, but they can't demonstrate it, so it's not true. Yeah. Some, some of the things were demonstrated in front of science, like uh, yeah. psychic phenomena, like uh, uh, telepathy, not, telepathy and stuff like that, but we are only entering nope. into that era of history in which these type of things is going to be manifested. Uh, yeah, so the, problem is, the problem is that, that, that this has been, these, these phenomena have been studied for hundreds of years. Right, but it was secretly... No, there is in fact not any scientific evidence that any of it is true. You, there are people with degrees willing to claim that it is, but if they can't demonstrate it to other scientists, they're, they're you know... They're no different than the mystics who thought of it in the first place. In that, in that sense, I completely agree with you, because unless it's being tested through a scientific method, it's not valid because it's a personal experience. On the other hand, not to be open to that possibility is also a limitation. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, openness is a good thing, but like Carl Sagan said, you want to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. You well, that, that's so what you there's into gotta be a point at which there's, there's got to be a point at which you know, come on, people! T two centuries of investigation into psychic phenomena has failed to come up with any compelling evidence that it's true. At some point, it's got to be reasonable to say, "Look, we're done looking at that. Let's move on." Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, uh, the, the the problem that you're going to have is that when you say there's some higher force or power, you're talking about something supernatural uh, that could violate uh, what we think of as the laws of physics. You know. Uh, of this universe about how matter and energy interact. Uh, and if that's what it takes for supernatural to exist and have any effect on us, because if it exists and doesn't have any effect on us, then it's pointless to worry about it, uh, well, we ought to be able to take it into a laboratory and do it. The difficulty you have is that for internal perceptions that people have, people uh, we know can have delusions of false fantasies of things that don't happen. We know schizophrenics uh, hear voices uh, because they have brain malfunctions or brain chemistry malfunctions. And we know that people tell lies. And when you cannot distinguish a uh, supposedly di a divine revelation claim or a claim of a, of a contact with some type of uh, higher uh, non-material uh, transcendental uh, mystical force, and you can't separate that out from a lie or a delusion, uh, then there's no reason to treat it as anything other than perhaps a lie or a delusion. I, I agree with that completely. I mean, the, the basis for any um, belief should be uh, through a personal validation, no question about it. Mm. I don't think it's what he was saying. 
<laughs> Pardon me? I don't think that's what Howard was saying. Well, he basically, I mean, if you're saying you the materialistic... Valid, you could personally validate something the way those mystics did. You right. sit and you meditate and you think and you convince yourself of something, yeah. right? Well, that's fine, but that personal validation is absolutely useless to anybody else unless you can show that that, that, that personal validation matches up with some reality. And that's where evidence comes in, you see. So okay. just convincing yourself isn't good enough. Being convinced by something that's good enough to convince other people at the same time, that's good enough. And then, uh, the other thing, I, if, there, if there's a phenomenon out there, I'd much rather have science investigate it and try to uh, learn about it and so that any uh, beneficial effects that come of that phenomena will be able to be trained and passed on to other people. Uh, instead of just saying it's mis you know, that it's God's will and and go with it, and I just want, uh, but go uh, ahead. Yeah, well, well, let me go back a minute to the to the personal mystical experience. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, have anyone think that I'm saying that in some sense this is not real. It is real in the sense that it's a, it's a real feeling, a real series of thoughts, real internal perceptions that a person has. Mm -hmm. uh, a real manifestation of uh, the materialistic mechanical processes of the body. In that sense, it's real. Uh, but we can imagine things which are unreal, okay? And the problem is sorting out which of our uh, ideas of reality, where we're trying to think in terms of what reality is as accurately as we can, which one of those ideas are, are accurate and valid and which ones are, are, are false. Uh, and just the fact that we can think up the idea, or a lot of other people may have thought up the idea, doesn't necessarily make the idea a real accurate representation of reality. Um, just one point. What, what if, what if the, it, it cannot be measured, meaning it's beyond the speed of light, meaning you enter into an area or dimension in which it cannot be measured, cannot be even thought, meaning uh, we are transcend the limitation of mm. the data that we can accumulate in order to make observations. Then, that uh, is the difficulty here, then, because then in that dimension there is no measure. Right. You cannot then, measure it, you cannot have equation. Then by definition we can't know anything about it, and so why are we wasting our time? But that is what the realm of spirituality comes, that's what the point uh, but, that but I mean. If there's some realm that we can't access, can't control, can't figure out any rules no. to govern it, can't predict what it's going to do, can't, and can't know anything about it, then why waste our time? Then we're just we, then we're just thinking about something that we have no business thinking about. Well, it's the same thing. Why do we go to space? Meaning we can uh, we can discover. We in fact, can I the mean, range of uh, that we can go to space. There's actually a place there. It's actually got physical laws governing it. You know, we can figure out how to deal in that environment. If, if a spiritual realm is a place where we can't figure anything out about, out about it, then, and it doesn't affect us in ways that we can detect, then it's, it, by, any, by all meaningful definitions, it doesn't exist. We shouldn't waste our time thinking about it. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your call. Thank yeah, you. you have a great Thanks week. Raising the questions. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just oh, okay. Let's go on down the line to Veronica. Hello. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I got a question. Yeah, I think there's no God. That, yep. <laughs> this is true. Well, see, there is a God. If there was no God, how will we be here today? Uh, Through the <laughs> no. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not laughing at your question because you asked it, Veronica. We're just we're laughing because it's a very frequent question, and here it is again. <laughs> yes. Well, we, see, y'all may may think there's no God right now. No. But wait till the year 2000 approaches. Y'all see him well, arrive. The year 2000 so. is approaching. It uh, approaching, and you know, gonna I don't see know if you've been watching the news. Y'all gonna or? see come. Yeah, he's yeah. gonna come. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah ma'am, are you prepared to not believe in him in him anymore if he doesn't come anytime in the year 2000? I'm prepared. You're prepared to stop believing in God if no, if the no, year 2000 see, arrives I and he's never I been there. That. I made my communion at all. <laughs> so, so what are you telling us? There is a God. Okay, so but, saying but you're, devil you're, saying we're gonna be, you're saying we're going to be convinced when God shows up in the year 2000. How come you're not going to be convinced if he doesn't? I don't know. Well, because you're, no. you're not really deciding to believe, him or, uh, believe in him or not based on any kind of rational so thought about you're, in just, the devil you're just or believing. Something? You yeah. believe in the devil? Yeah. No? No. Why should we? And, uh, please, please continue to watch our show into the year 2000, and, uh, and we will report... Uh, if God or Jesus or anyone comes down here in the year 2000, we will gladly report it on our we'll show. We'll have them on the show. Well, yeah. see, in the year 2000, we ain't going to have no electricity. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> if you're watching our show anyway, you'll know <laughs> that didn't come through. There you go. Well, for, for, for Veronica, as a last comment, uh, Christians have been believing for 2,000 years now that Jesus is going to come back soon. And uh, there's you know, lots of Christians who've died believing that, lots of ministers who've preached it who've died believing that. And when you go back to, I think it's in Matthew, where uh, Jesus talks about some of the people that are listening to him uh, then are, are going to see him return. And obviously that didn't happen unless there's the 2,000-year-old Jews still floating around. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's a story that's already been proven to be false. And uh, uh, it, it, it's not going to happen during your lifetime would be the expectation to look for. All right, uh, Monica, we, we have other callers. Thank you. Thank you thank have you. a great week. Even, what's his name, uh, not Falwell, the other guy, uh, has put off his his prediction for the return of Jesus to the year 3000. Because <laughs> he doesn't want to go out of business. <laughs> yes. All right. HB? Uh, KLBJ? <laughs> Dale? Dale? Is this you? Uh, Hello, D Dale, it's Willie again. <laughs> what the hell, what are you guys talking about? Do you uh, have any idea? Yes. The Do you know? The Christian nation. What a Christian nation we have. Okay. Well, don't have. Well, you know, brother in arms, I'm right behind you. All right. All right, peace. Peace. Okay. <laughs> what was that all about? It's a friend of mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go on down to Judy. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh, one thing I'd like to say to you as a panel, first of all, I appreciate your... Um, your intelligence and your knowledge uh, with which you present your statement and your articulation. I've Thank you. Sometimes it's a little uh, loud and a little hard to, uh, to deal with. I have a very personal uh, question, and you sure. may, not, may not be able to answer this for me, but it's something that... We'll give it our best shot. Okay. Um, I grew up uh, in a Christian community. Went to church every Sunday with everyone and enjoyed the pageantry, enjoyed the camaraderie, enjoyed mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed the mythology, if you will. They were wonderful okay. stories. And uh, at a, a later age, I began to question the rules that they wanted to enforce, regardless of, of how um, to the point they seemed to be, and eventually came to a place where it was easy to turn my back on uh, their philosophy, turn my back on the activity. But I have had times in my life when uh, I have faced the fact that I am genuinely and truly alone in this life. Uh, my perceptions of it, my reactions to it, that's all there is other than what uh, acts on me or what I have to act on. And I felt a loss. And I wonder if I'm just a, an, an intellectual weakling. Am I am no. I unable to to deal with the fact that when I, I dig no. deep into my my soul, my spirit, and find my belief in God lacking, no, and no. yet I have a sorrow about that. Well, it's not a lot. Uh, uh, great philosophers through the years have pondered those same questions. So it, uh, you don't feel uh, inferior. For asking the questions, uh, and I, I had well, thought that yeah, yeah, thank you, because I lost yeah, my train of thought. <coughs> yeah, Judy, uh, what you're describing, I think, is is very common uh, uh, to, to humans. Uh, you were a part of a human community where there was a society and a culture where uh, you felt uh, safe and supported, and, and uh, you you belonged, and you had a role, and you had a place. Uh, and and we're evolved social animals, and those are all. Uh, things that meet a lot of instincts we have. Uh, and when you decide that, uh, the, that that it's based on something which you think is probably false, uh, you didn't go into detail, but there was something about it that uh, you, you decided you couldn't go along with anymore, particularly the rules, uh, as I recall you mentioning, um, uh, it, it is going to leave you with a sense of loss because you have something uh, that has been part of your life that you uh, had learned to... Uh, uh, Passing uh, like giving up Santa. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ha having help from the uh, floor crew. Uh, you, you have a sense of loss uh, because you, you did have emotional attachments to it. And uh, your, your brain, uh, when you grew up, did uh, go into a pattern of where you expected that and, and wanted that. Uh, and, and we're all going to have times when we uh, feel alone and, and we feel lost. I think that's, that is the human condition at times. 
uh, because we're not always going to have our loved ones around us. We're not always going to have a supportive community around us. Uh, and that doesn't make us uh, any, any less a human being. Uh, it doesn't mean that life isn't any uh, less worth living. Uh, what it means is, is that we're experiencing uh, some of the emotions and feelings that we have from time to time, which are good survival uh, emotions and good helpful emotions uh, that usually end up motivating us to kind of do something about it and, and change our, our situation so that we can take care of that need that our, that our body is, is kind of telling us about. I, I hope I'm making some sense here for you. Yes, indeed, and I appreciate it. I, I, I can tell you, it was sitting in the, the front row of the choir loft and seeing all of the women dressed in black and the gentlemen with the canes in the front pews and realizing that if there was validity to what was being said, uh, all of those people and I were going to be in heaven and everybody I loved was going to be in hell. Yeah, right. that's, that, that's, that's, that's a hard realization. Uh, but uh, atheists struggle with some of these things from a different standpoint. Uh, uh, a lot of atheists, uh, when they give up church and going, uh, tend to try to give up uh, that, that whole social experience and give up the, the whole idea of ritual. And uh, I, I've come to believe that humans are kind of a ritualistic animal. Uh, we do like uh, repeatable experiences uh, that are enjoyable, uh, that, that, that give us uh, some kind of positive emotional uh, uh, feedback. And uh, if, if atheism has failed in this country, and I think we atheists have failed and, and we have ourselves to blame for it, sure. it is because we haven't uh, developed uh, uh, ways of meeting our human, emotional, and social needs uh, as effectively as Christianity did, regardless of whether or not Christianity was based on a lie. Well, perhaps the, the search for some sort of spirituality is, is in itself spiritual. Uh, depending on how you define <laughs> spiritual. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you, you, Judy. You have a great week. Thank you. All right, let's go on down to Steve. Oh, hi. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Actually, what I was going to uh, talk about was very similar to what you were just uh, talking about. It seems to me when I go to um, uh, functions and and uh, you know prayer is said or uh, something of that nature, it always strikes me that... Um, it would be nice if we could be, uh, you know, rational thinking uh, people. But in general, I, I think you know the vast majority of people like to have uh, religion uh, because it 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 doesn't require you to think. You know, it gives you the uh, everything spelled out in in simplistic terms, and you know, and everything is based on faith. Uh, whereas in basically what we're talking about, you know, requires you to actually have to think. And, uh, and speak in, in very rational terms, and it requires you to use your brain. Exactly. And um, but, but anyway, I, a lot of stuff that you said was pre what you said previously, so um, uh, I like your show. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. We're always puzzled by how many, um, how many uh, theists we have watching this show, and, and it seems to me that they, that they like using their brains. Yes. You know, if that's if that's an uh, uh, an activity that they enjoy, thinking about deep issues, uh, it it excites them and it gives them some kind of uh, you know the good feelings in their life. Then, well, that may be a, a window that religion has left open for uh, for atheism to be attractive. You know, because this way, if if you're not accepting some dogma, hook, line, and sign, uh, uh, and sinker. You are free to think about stuff, and you know that, that's fun. All right, let's go on down the line to Pierre. Hi, uh, this is Pierre. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the answer to Judy's question about whether um, let me think um, about the, lo the the emptiness you feel. Yes. As a, an atheist, um, I think all humans have um, have evolved religiously. It's, it's a um, characteristic of Homo sapiens. Yes. To be religious. Well, no. No. So <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not exactly going to agree. I th uh, clearly, <laughs> there's individual differences. In my case, I I don't feel empty. I've never felt that. Ever, you know, and but, but, I think but you're I an exception. Recognize that there that that is a common thing that a lot I, of people feel. I think you're the exception there. All right. <laughs> hey, that, but, uh, but but I've, I've I've several points. Well, we got some hands going up okay. in, the, in the crew. Okay. Quickly, your points. Yeah, and I also believe that um, uh, you, things do not exist um, statically. Everything that that exists is 
um, a process. In other words, it, it doesn't have to be created, it's growing and evolving. I mean, everything is evolving. I mean, it, not only are living things evolution, everything that exists is, an evolu is evolution. Um, uh, from the Big Bang and out, outside this universe. I mean, this universe, this universe, this universe approaches um, uh, nothing. I mean, <laughs> uh, sorry, I have to be very, very difficulty speaking, but... No, I, I think I understand your point, though. Well, uh, he's talking about stuff going on outside the universe, and I wanted to ask well, how he, you could know what's going slipped, on outside the universe. I think he slipped there, but... That's right. And, uh, but uh, continue with your comment. Yeah, my point was, was that, that everything that is this is a process. Yeah, and, uh, and not, it's not a thing. Uh, and it's forever changing, right? So, uh, so God is not necessary. No. I mean, I, I, I and I'm not sure I uh, technically agree with your description of why that's the case, but uh, yeah, well, yeah. why why do you think is the case? Huh? I mean, that 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 everything is a process. I mean, well, well, it's evolving. That's why it's growing. There are processes going on all over the place. Right? Yes, exactly. And even a rock can get. Like uh, affected by natural selection, if there are if there are is a change in conditions that make that rock incapable of existing, well, exactly. it stop existing. That's but what that's I mean. Not to say that the rock doesn't exist. The rock is part of a process. But I'm I'm nitpicking now. And no, it doesn't <laughs> if, have to be created. If all this adds up to you don't believe in God, <laughs> yeah, poor power to you. Yeah, uh, yeah, no. Jeff, he, he was agreeing with this, and you were nitpicking. And, and, what <laughs> and, and, and one more, and, go ahead. And another thing is. The complexity, the immense complexity, I mean, that we, we have no idea of, of how complex um, the universe and beyond the universe is. How, how can there be any intelligence? <laughs> He's done the beyond the universe again. Yeah, why, why can there be any intelligence, I mean, within this universe, how complex it is. Yeah. How can there be any intelligence that can comprehend this? And, and why do you have to, seeing this complexity, create another thing, another person yeah. or thing that is just as complex for an explanation? Right. Yeah. Anyway, that, 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 I think that's I've said enough. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Wait. Yes. Uh, yeah. Didn't mean to nitpick yet. Yeah. Let, let, let me make one sure, last comment ahead. because because it does get something that's very important for atheists uh, and everyone for that matter, uh, and that's this idea of complexity. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, sometimes is thrown at atheists is we can't know everything, so we can't exclude the possibility of God, and we can't absolutely disprove God. Uh, and the reality of the universe we live in is, is that we have brains that cannot know everything, uh, couldn't comprehend it all probably if we did, so we're always going to be faced with having to live unknowns. And our job is to uh, uh, look at the information we get and sort it out and try to figure out what reality is. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, on, on that basis, you know, all the evidence I get piles up over here that says the universe is materialistic and, and, and the magic side uh, for evidence n it never gets anything valid and testable in it. So my you know, logical thing that my brain has evolved to do is say, hey, the most accurate description of reality is, is materialistic even though I can't know everything and I'll always have to deal with unknowns and I'll always have to accept the fact that uh, I, I'm dealing on partial information and, and, and that's what I have to do. That's how we all have to exist. Right. And but when, when you use that lack of knowledge as an yeah. excuse mm -hmm. to allow your emotions to tell you what your what to believe is true, then you're you're making a mistake. Not because you're, uh, uh, you know, not because there's anything necessarily wrong with believing in stuff per se, but if you abandon the process of being careful about what you're going to believe, and you just start believing anything that feels good to you, just on the grounds that you can't disprove it, then you know you're 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 not pursuing life in a way that's going to lead you in directions where you you figure out stuff that you can use to to improve your condition. All right, uh, we're going to try to get as many phone calls as we can here in the last few minutes. Okay. Joel. Yeah, you had a caller right. earlier that said that she believed God was coming back in the year 2000. Yes. I just wanted to point out that the Bible teaches that no one is to know the day or hour, and uh, people who do set dates like that are, are going against what the Bible teaches. Yeah. I appreciate it. going to look like idiots when it doesn't happen, as yeah. it hasn't happened, you know, thousands of other times when it's been predicted. Okay, but the Bible clearly says no one can know. So yeah, it, it, it also says that Jesus said he'd come back within a lifetime of people living there. Well, actually, but if, Bible contradictions if aren't. you do read on to the next verse, I think you're talking about Matthew. Yes. Sure. Sixteen twenty-eight. If you read on to uh, chapter seventeen, he did take three of them up on a mountain. The Bible says and revealed to them his glory and coming. So right. 
Uh, that, it, it's that still, proved. it's still. I, I think it's still contradictions, but that wasn't quite our topic today. But anyway, thank you for the call. <laughs> you have a great week. Let's go on down the line here to uh, Fred. Hello. Good Fred. morning. Hey, guys, come on. Work with me now here. All right. Okay. okay. All right. I've been up all night pondering, the listening to your show. Jessica, say hello to Ray. <laughs> Hello, Jessica. Yes. All right. Is the yeah. birthday girl still up? Yeah. She just woke up. She just woke up. <laughs> that's, that's what we wanted to hear. All right. And um, peace be with you. I love you guys. Later. Take care. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. Let's go on down the line <laughs> to <laughs> Rob. Hey guys, how y'all doing? Hey, good morning. Real good. Uh, I have a little question to ask you guys kind of a situation sure. first of all I would like to ask if you guys have ever uh, been believers in God uh, I guess I can't really uh, I was uh, brainwashed as a kid there to where I, I didn't know what I, my own mind was until so, at, so at some point you did believe in God I, I, I thought that was I thought that's what I was supposed to do we'll okay, put it that well. way I, I, I don't think I actually believed in God but I thought I was actually doing what my uh, my parents and everybody and society wanted me to do. I think that's probably very similar to my situation then. Um, basically, you know, my folks are still real firm believers, so I just um, wonder. I hate to be a hypocrite and <laughs> go well, along with it and make them think that I believe, but at the same time, I know to kill them, them knowing that I don't believe. Right. Um. So. Uh, my parents are both Methodist ministers. Or actually, let scratch that. They've retired from the Methodist Church, and now they're going to be running a non-denominational church in uh -huh. their retirement. Um, What's but, their opinion on uh, what you believe? Well, see, up until about three years ago, they didn't know. Oh. And I just got completely sick of lying to them. Okay. I thought that, I thought that you know, I knew that they wouldn't like it, and I knew I was risking, uh, you know, creating a rift in my family between me and my parents, and I was, I was very, very concerned about that. But I thought that if I really cared about them as human beings, that what I ought to do is level with them. Huh. And so that's what I did. And it's turned out to be nowhere near as bad as I expected. No kidding. Uh, yeah, but, but it, does, it does sort of depend on the family, because I've, I've heard some stories from some people that, uh, uh, you know, d depending on the degree of uh, fundamentalism, if... if you know, we can use that word generically, I guess. Uh, some people have been pretty much ostracized by their families. Uh, and family relationships are important. I mean, there are people that you love and care about, uh, even though you, you have a different belief. Uh, and, and well, you my just mother is Baptist, and my yeah. dad is Church of Christ, so that was a real nice combination. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting <laughs> that you should necessarily do what yeah. I did, but, but yeah, um, well, you know, I, it's a tough that, That's a tough been call. the tough thing for yeah. me, because I hate to lie about it. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I understand where you come from. It, uh, I, my my grandmother passed away not knowing that I was an atheist. I didn't think she could ever take the news. So it, uh, she was a devout Christian woman. Went to church every Sunday. It, uh, so I never did uh, confess my atheism to her before she passed away. I guess most people know or have relatives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh well. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You have a great day. No, no big deal. All right. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, but this does point up one of the things sure. that we keep hearing uh, from people, from Christians, that, uh, gosh, I don't know anybody who's atheist. There's nobody an atheist in my small town. And uh, it, it's basically because uh, people are, are afraid to be open about it, and with some justification. Let's try to get as many as we can here. Let's go on down. Jimmy? Hi, guys. How you doing? Hi. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if I read this somewhere, or I saw this on a television show, that Adolf Hitler uh, was a student of evolution. I guess they taught that to him and when he was in school and it carried out with him throughout his last days. And the thing is, I believe that um, most atheists believe in evolution. Is that correct? Uh, it, probably. Yeah, that, it, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that general statement okay, just because well, we run out of time. Point. Okay, go the ahead. point is, is that that creates then survival of the fittest, right? That mentality of the strongest shall survive and the weak shall just perish. Well, what it all it has to do. Do you see what, how this? Do you see how uh, how can I, can I radical respond? this can lead to? Yeah, can I respond to that? Sure. I mean, all it has to do is show that that's how nature behaves. 
that has really nothing at all to do with how we should behave. Uh, let me let, let me give you another response to that also, and, and, and uh, Jeff, Jeff is right, but uh, uh, I think that humans have evolved uh, all of the moral altruism which uh, many religions credit to their gods. Uh, when you say strongest and survival of the fittest, uh, strongest uh, can mean uh, the ability to uh, uh, love the other people in your group, which gives the group cohesion, and your chances of survival and reproducing in the group are better. Uh, so uh, all of the, the good moral behaviors that religions claim, I think, are part of our instincts, and they're part of our instincts because they have proven themselves through a process of natural selection. They have proven themselves worthwhile. Uh, we, are, we are capable of love and compassion and help in, in sharing and risking ourselves uh, for others uh, because uh, those are traits which have proven themselves by this uh, survival of the fittest process. Yeah, There's the, the whole amoral natural selection thing that resulted in us having the instincts that we have uh, th that you know we look at and say well that's that's our morality they put us in a position to look back on the process that selected those traits for us and say well that process is this amoral thing that's just churning mm -hmm. out you know species that can survive well we act the way we act and and natural selection acts the way it acts there's nothing in uh, you know understanding natural selection that that leads to human beings automatically running out and like you know grabbing everything they can with a, no thought about the consequences. Uh, did you have any other point? Uh, no, mate. Basically, that was it. I I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great week. It's going down the line to Steve. 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 <laughs> you guys doing a good job. HB. Another friend of yours. You know, it's HB again. That, that's yeah. cool. It's Steve, man. All right, this is Steve. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. It's not HB. All right, go ahead, Steve. HB's cousin. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say we watch your show and we're, we're followers. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so you're going to come on down to the uh, Furs at North Cross Mall? Yeah. Are you? Okay, fantastic. We'll be there at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Now, those are your groupies. They're not my groupies, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Okay, is it 9 o'clock? <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you can see, it, uh, that party continues on as we speak. <laughs> uh, it, uh, without me. They're going on without me. What can I say? Yes, yes, yes. Let's go on back to uh, Veronica. Hello? Veronica. Hi. Yeah, it's me again. I, I was. Oh, uh, well, I forgot to tell you. Y'all said it never happened before? Well, uh, the world came to an end? Yeah. It did before. It, it came, when did it come to an end? When the world flooded, when it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> that did happen because they made a movie of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> they made a movie of Star Wars, man. Do you think nah, that happened? see, this is like has a Moses and all them up in it. Yeah. I'm telling you, it happened before. They made a movie of, uh, mm -hmm. of War and Peace. Do you think that makes that an historical novel? <laughs> yeah, let me say. Let me go back to some uh, biblical references for Veronica. Uh, I have not tested this out for myself, Veronica, so it, it may be that you can prove me wrong. Uh, my understanding is is that uh, in uh, properly translated uh, versions of uh, Genesis, uh, that if you add up the ages, you know those long, you know five and seven and nine hundred year ages of the of the patriarchs given them. Uh -huh. Uh, and, and you follow the years through uh, correctly, mm -hmm. what you find out is that uh, a number of them would have lived, uh, had to have lived past the time of the Great Flood. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is, uh, this is, you know, one among many reasons to accept it just as a story, but, but since uh, you're coming from a very uh, biblical, religious viewpoint, uh, I thought maybe something that you might be able to check out for yourself uh, in, in your Bible uh, might give you something to start with. Uh, no, because they say the world's coming to an end by the world's going to be on fire. Don't yeah. No. So if it doesn't happen, you're going to stop believing all that stuff, right? Well, you're going to yeah. realize that the people who told you that don't know what they're talking about and stop believing well, it stuff if it doesn't happen, Well, it does show it in the Bible, right? too. Hmm. It does show that it's, it's going to, like, bleed. It's going to cry okay, blood. Okay, If all that doesn't happen, you're going to realize the Bible is just a book of stories that aren't true, and you're going to stop believing in it, right? Uh, and it... Answer me a question. Uh, do you vote? Uh, yeah. You, you, you vote? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, that's scary. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. Wait, no let, me, let, let me go back and, uh, to, to Veronica because I, I think I, I have an idea where she's coming from. And uh, 
uh, it, it'll be most helpful if, if we talk at that level. Uh, if, if you really believe that sometime in the next uh, year, 15, 18 months, whatever it is, uh -huh. uh, that Jesus is going to come back uh, and that, uh, I don't know if you believe in the rapture, but whatever events that you believe will occur at that time are, are going to happen, yeah. uh, and, and they do not happen, uh, I, I would suggest that a good starting place for you would be not to try to make a global jump to questioning everything that you believe about religion, uh, but take the step that uh, many people do from your viewpoint of uh, looking at the stories in Genesis and the Old Testament uh, and the mythology and doing some research and trying to figure out for yourself that whatever you believe about God and divinity, uh, perhaps the Bible is not uh, the inerrant uh, word of God uh, that many people believe it is, but some of it is is stories, and at least to have that as a start point. Howard, Howard, okay, and I got another question. I'm, I'm being, I'm I being gentle with it. I, I know, but <laughs> uh, go ahead, Veronica. She has another question. Are y'all like Ku Klux Klan or something? No, no. Even God? No, Ku Klux Klan people have uh, historically used uh, harassed the yeah. and killed free thinkers and atheists. And, then, and like yeah. y'all are, they're Christians. Like, I don't believe in God and all that. No, uh, Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization. We're perfectly so nice people. We're just nice for because we think it's the right way to be, not because we think that there's a God that said if you're not nice, you get burned in hell. Well, that is true. So, uh, okay. I, I just, I'm just amazed that you took the time out to call our show. Uh, that's okay. No, we're, 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 we're glad, though, That's uh, because that's yeah, uh, how I'm people ask. Right now. You're working. Oh. Yeah, oh. I got AMF showcase link. Okay. 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 Thank and you. They're, so they're paying for this. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, you're taking this woman who believes that 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 the flood is true because they made a movie of it. You're <laughs> suggesting that you do some math and some research to figure no. out what's going on. No, no. But, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but but, uh, but but the thing is, is is I think. I mean, your your point your point is exactly right, but but people have to start, I think, with with what they can, what they can deal with, and going from a very uh, fundamentalist uh, conception of, of the Bible as the divinely revealed word of God, all the way to saying there there is no God, is is a large step. I didn't and, and, say that. I just you said know. you know that the, the Bible is a book of stories, well, well, which is which know, is what those non fundamentalist Christians believe. But 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 the fundamentalists that I have talked to who have become atheists did not did not make a leap. They. Yeah. They they went they went with just the kinds of questions that, that Veronica is facing uh, and looking at uh, where where they are looking at the Bible as an error or of God and there are no errors and mistakes and they can take it all for granted uh, and, and it's when that begins to break down that they learn to question and think yeah. for themselves I'm whether just, or not I they become atheists. It's hard to imagine yeah. her sitting there with a notepad and pencil adding up the age of the society. Well, well, I, well I, I, I hope I hope she does. <laughs> and uh, and I, I made the comment about the intelligence level of our callers. It, it started off so well. It uh, it's went downhill in the last oh, twenty no, minutes. Back. They disagreed with us, so it's down here. Yeah, exactly. Who cares about stuff? That's that's something. All right, we're down to two and a half minutes here. Let's go on. Matt? Yeah, my we wife and I just moved to Austin uh, about two months ago. We're from the buckle of the Bible Belt, Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right. And uh, I personally don't subscribe to any religion, and I find it com really intriguing that you guys are on television here. And I was wondering what your purpose is and what message you're propagating and whatnot. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we're trying to put a good face to atheists. Atheists have got such a bad rap, and uh, so we wanted to let uh, people know that we're a real pe community out there, that uh, we're a wide spectrum of the uh, population there, uh, and just to put a real face to atheism. Excellent. Well, uh, my wife had another question. Sure. Uh, what is the difference between agnostic and atheism? We get this one all the time. Well, I'd let you go, though. We're, we're down to... T yes. All right. I love this question. You have a great... The, the, my, per my personal favorite, and there may be disagreements, so everybody, we've got a turn. My personal favorite distinction between those two terms is from... Um, George Smith's book, uh, Atheism, the Case Against God, he draws a distinction between atheism as a statement about what you believe and agnosticism as a statement about what you think is knowable. And by that definition, uh, you can be an atheist if you think it's impossible to know whether a god exists, but you just don't believe in one. And you can also be an agnostic theist if you believe in God, but ad admit that there's no evidence that you just take it on faith. Uh, so that, that to me is the distinction. Excellent. Um, Anybody want, want to comment no, on that? I know there are different. I, th I think you, you're probably got your minute to wrap up here. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if we're going one more or not. No, we don't have else. Uh, okay. And, uh, yeah. Just want to remind everyone this show is brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. And uh, we're here every Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Oh, invite those folks to the bagel shop. And every, oh, we can't. 
so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, uh, Matt and his wife, the, the new people from uh, Tulsa there, uh, we uh, meet every Sunday down at the High Jumble Bakery, except for the first Sunday of every month, which is today. We're going to be at Furs at North Cross Mall. We're having Steven Weinberg as our guest speaker. And at 11. At 11 a.m. It's free and open to the public. Anybody's welcome to come out and hear this lecture. It should be quite good. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to finish up with. Other than we, we love Austin. We love all the Christians, the Hindus, everyone out there. We appreciate all your calls. You want to say anything, Howard? You got 10 seconds. Uh, well, you guys got a website. My email for my newsletter is gofreemind at aol.com. It's free if you want it. Fantastic. Bye, folks. We love you. <laughs>